in Luke 19, you say, but that's not the scripture verse up there. We're in John. Luke 19, we find an interesting account about a short man. <laughs> Shout out to all us vertically challenged people. <laughs> Somebody just told me to stand up. <laughs> And I know that you're probably all familiar with Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he, right? It was interesting. I read this account just the other day, and as I was reading through, something hit me. And I want to share this with you before we get started because it's applicable to us. In verse 4 of Luke 19 Talking about Zacchaeus, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Talking about Jesus. For Jesus was going to pass that way. And as I saw that, I was like, what isn't that something? We've got a man here who's, by all accounts, is not a good person. People did not like Zacchaeus. You know why? He was a tax collector. I still don't like that. (laughs) We still don't like tax collectors. I mean, it's just... There, you know, somebody says, what's your job? And they say, I'm a tax A what? <laughs> it was April 15th comes around every year? Every, every year. Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and by all means, he was not considered uh, the cream of the crop. People didn't like him. But Zacchaeus was making an effort because he heard that Jesus was on the way. He heard that the Son of God was coming. And even though he didn't do the things that we would consider right, and he was probably a very crooked person, Zacchaeus made what? An effort. He knew that if he didn't get high enough, he was not going to be able to see this Jesus that was coming his way. If he didn't get close enough, he wasn't going to be able to see Jesus coming his way. And Zacchaeus knew that he had to do something to see Jesus. He branched out. That's right. (laughs) Oh, boy. That was Mark's, by the way, not mine. Just saying. He had to do something. Because he knew if he didn't do something, he wasn't going to be able to see Jesus. He knew that if he witnessed, didn't step out, he wasn't going to be able to see Jesus because he was of short stature. Shout out again to the short people. Amen. So Zacchaeus did something. He decided to run on ahead. And I can only imagine these short little legs running as fast as he could to get to a place where he knew he could climb up, and that was that sycamore tree, to get above those all those tall people out there, all those people that could see what's going on, all the people that stand in the front row that are a whole lot taller than you. (laughs) I'm just picking, brother. Zacchaeus found his spot and he climbed up that tree. Now I want you to see something. Zacchaeus was expecting something. What he, he, now what he was not expecting was what happened. But he was expecting something and he did not want to miss it. And I hope that you come this morning with the thoughts like Zacchaeus that I want to expect something today. You see, we can just be part of the crowd. We can just stand back. And say, yeah, Jesus came through today. But not me. I want to be like Zacchaeus in this sense. I want to come running to a place. Come to a place where I'm expecting to see the Messiah. I'm expecting to see him move. I'm expecting to see his presence and his glory poured out. I'm expecting something awesome to happen today. I want you to get that expectation going. Because we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. We're talking about the power that we have been given by the Messiah himself so that we can live in his power, so that we can walk in his power, so that we can live as witnesses and be a witness to this dark and scary world. We're going to look at the disciples that prior to them being baptized in the Holy Ghost, they were scared for their lives. They scared, as we say in the South. They were scared. They were hiding in a locked room. They were behind closed doors with the doors locked, but that didn't stop Jesus, did it? I hope that we've come with expectancy like Zacchaeus to run on ahead in a sense, a spiritual sense of expectation to see what the Lord is going to do. 
When Zacchaeus got up into that tree, then you know the account. Jesus came walking by and Jesus stopped right there. There was something about that expectancy in Zacchaeus' heart that drew the Savior to him. And Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus. And that should have blown his mind right there that Jesus knew his name. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. He's like, oh, great, I'm going to struck down from this tree right now. No, he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there because I'm going to your house today. Music to Zacchaeus' ears. Sweet, beautiful music. I want Jesus coming to my house today. How about you? I want him in my place. I want to make room for him, and Zacchaeus did just that. He made room for the Savior, not just the Savior, but a whole crowd of people had come to Zacchaeus' house. All the people that hated Zacchaeus, they were there at Zacchaeus' house. They wanted to see what Jesus was going to do to Zacchaeus, I would imagine. Please strike him dead with a bolt of lightning. That's not what Jesus came to do, did it? Did he? No, he came to Zacchaeus' house for salvation. And as they're sitting there, Zacchaeus says, Lord, I give half of all that I own to the poor. Now, you've got to realize that Zacchaeus was a rich man. He was a very short and rich man. And then he said, and if I've cheated anybody, I restore four times what I stole from them. You've got to realize how big this is because prior to this encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus' heart was wrapped up in his wallet. Or his money purse. I know they probably didn't have leather wallets back then. And for him to say, I give away half of what I own and then I'm going to restore four times what I've stole was a huge heart change. I see where you're going. With a huge heart change in Zacchaeus' life. It's easy to get comfortable where we are at. Oh, I didn't see this one coming. It's, I'm going to say that again because this is going to be important for what I'm about to say next. It's very easy to get comfortable where we are at. It's easy to get comfortable in this church. It's easy to get comfortable in our lives. It's easy to stay status quo because flowing against the stream takes work. It takes effort. It takes a change of heart because any dead fish can swim downstream. I've seen it. You flop them in there and they, they could do belly up. But it takes something alive to go against the flow. It takes something alive to do what Christ has called us to do. Did you know that Jesus has called us to love the unlovable? That's easy to talk about that. It's a whole other ball game to actually put in an action. Christ is calling us to love the unlovables. I want you to take just a moment, and it shouldn't take long, to think of somebody who grates your nerves. And it may even be your pastor, but whoever it is, somebody that you think, that heathen, I don't want to spend another second around them. They're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, they're just, they're jerks. I want you to think of somebody that you know, and they, listen, I'm not talking about anybody in this church. So the outside of the church where you thought if they walked through the doors of this church, your first thought would be, what in the world are they doing here? Now, with that thought in mind, well, that's not a very pretty picture you're painting there, Pastor Jason. That was a lot of peas in that sentence. How would Jesus respond to that person? I got a feeling that if Jesus were walking down the street and there was a big crowd and that person was short, and there was a, a stand nearby or a newspaper stand or did they even have, yeah, they do, uh, something. And that person was standing on that stand that Jesus would walk, walk, walk by and say, Billy Bob, I'm coming to your house today. How should we respond? With love. That's right. We should respond with love. But it's going to take a heart change in us. As a congregation, as believers. To physically reach out and love on people. To love on the unlovable. To love on the hated. To love on the ones that nobody else wants. Are we willing to make that sacrifice? Are we willing to make that change? Are we willing to walk in Jesus' footsteps and follow after the Master? I'm going to tell you this. It's going to take His grace in our lives to do these things.
it's also going to take empowerment. And this is where we're at this morning. It's going to take empowerment by the Holy Spirit. It's going to take His power and grace to flow through us. To love the unlovable. But honestly, the first step we need to take, any person in this place, the very first step that needs to take place is salvation. Amen. And that's following after the Lord Jesus Christ with every fiber of our being. Not just 80% of us, not just 95%, but all 100% of our being following after the Lord. That means sacrifices in our lives. Ooh, the flesh does not like sacrifice. My flesh still don't like sacrifice, but my spirit loves it. You know, we're, our flesh wars against the spirit. There's a fight going on there, talking about punch out today. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have victory. We sang the song this morning. They came, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And that empowerment comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. So first things first is salvation. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But I want to encourage you. If you're in this place and you haven't fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know who you are. You still do the things that the world does. But you come to church on Sunday and you worship like everything's cool. If you're in this place and the Lord's been dealing with you in your heart, and you're like, no, I know something's got to change. Or you've been in a pattern of behavior that needs to break. That cycle needs to break. I'm telling you, you are in the right place. Amen. And that today is the day of salvation. Don't wait until tomorrow. Amen. Tomorrow may not come. You know, each and every one of us, our lives, our days are numbered. We don't know when day is coming. Now, I know that the Lord has shown some people over the years the day that they're going to step out of this world. I understand that. But for the most part... Most all of us in here won't do, know the day or the hour. Last night we heard a testimony of a man who went to the beach with his family. And in the course of this, this testimony, he lost his wife while they were at the beach 20, somewhat, 25 years ago. Something like that. I don't remember. Something that was not expected. Something that wasn't planned for. You don't know the day you're going to check out and how it's going to happen. So I want to encourage you this morning. As we dig into the Word of God, as we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, if you haven't accepted Christ as Savior, to seriously consider making that step. There is nothing more important than your eternal salvation. Amen. There is nothing more important than your soul. Because I'm going to tell you this, this is, this is going to sound funny, but forever is a long time. Amen. It never stops. And only those that have applied the blood of the Lamb or following after Christ are going to make it in through the doors. Because there's coming a day when the Lord's going to look at some people and say, get away from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. As somebody who works in sin and lives in sin. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have success, we can have victory. And let's dive right into our scriptures this morning. Would you please stand with me as we read from John chapter 20. John chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. And the scripture says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. I'd imagine at that point they would need that sentence. And when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had heard, said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And saith he to Thomas, Reach here your finger, behold my hands, and reach here your hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. You are blessed in this place. 
And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray over this uh, sermon this morning, this this and this gathering this morning with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, and if any in this place as well that, that doesn't know Jesus as Savior. That today would be the day of salvation for them. And Lord, I'm asking for an outpouring of your precious Holy Spirit in a mighty way. And that we would, we would be graced with your presence. That we would be blessed with your presence in this place. Continued presence in this place. I thank you for being here during the worship. And I thank you for being here during the sermon as well. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, again, today we're going to be looking at what changed a group of fear-filled disciples into a bunch of faith-filled, on-fire believers for God. And I can remember as a kid, I learned this really cool trick. It's called static electricity. And then living in Ohio, it was, it was dry in the winter times. In the winter time, it was dry. And we, had, it, it, we used to have shag carpet. Y'all remember shag carpet, right? It's like this thick. All right, maybe not that thick. I, it was the, the house that we lived in was actually belonged to my grandparents prior to us moving there. And when we go to over Grandma and Grandpa's house, I would always find pennies in the carpet. And, and yeah, I'd, I'd dig through the carpet. I'd be like, oh, a penny. Can I keep it, Grandma? Yeah, you can have it. Thank you. But that carpet there was also a lot of fun because in the wintertime, I'd put my socks on and shuffle my feet across there. And then go up to my brother, Kitaya! or go up to a door handle and Kitaya! it would hurt, but it was awesome because I had electricity flowing out my finger. Well, one night I slept upstairs, and one night it was a cold night. I, I had my sleeping bag, and I moved my legs, and this, and I went to go move the sleeping bag, and as I did, a spark jumped out of my finger about this long. I was like, "Wow, that's cool." I wonder if I could do that again. So I moved my feet and I stuck my finger up. There was a cavity and I had it built up like this. And a spark jumped out about that far. I was like, what? And it hurt. I was like, i got to do this again. <laughs> and I moved my feet again. And this time, I mean, I built up. I thought, I'm going to build up a big old charge. And I stuck my finger. I was this far away from the top of that thing. And a bolt, and not just a bolt, but legs come off this thing. Going, and I was like, Ow! That's awesome! And I must have done that for 30 minutes. My finger hurt, but it was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. There's power in static electricity. And I promise you this, I'm not exaggerating what I saw because it was, I, I, those pictures of those shocking, it was a shocking thing, those Bolts coming out of my finger will be forever etched in my memory. A bazillion years from now, I'll remember that day. That was one of the coolest things I've seen. The Holy Spirit was an electric shock to the disciples. He empowered them. He empowered those frightened followers and enabled them to become the first, the formative and foundational generation of the Christian church. And the Holy Spirit enables believers in Christ to, to deliver a punch-out blow to the enemy. To deliver a punch-out blow to fear, doubt, and unbelief. In the book of John, it, kind of an overview here, it starts with, if you read the book of John, in the beginning. And, and then it, it continues with, in the garden, and then it culminates with, in the upper room. And it ends with these words in John 21, 25. And there also many, were also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Did you catch that? Jesus did so many more things that aren't even recorded in the Bible that John says that if you were to write them down, the world could not contain the books of the things that Jesus did. That tells me right there that there were probably more spit eyeballs made from Jesus Christ. There were probably more tongues that got spat on. There were probably more um, people that he spoke to and said, be healed. There were many, many more things like this that happened because of the power that flows through him. And he wants us to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. To be sensitive to his leading. To be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. To lay hands on the sick. And to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Now usually for the observance of Pentecost. We focus 
on the dramatic moment described in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, even though I understand today is not Pentecost, we will look into the fact that the Lord is still writing his story through us in the power of Pentecost. Amen? In the Gospel of John, the gift of the Holy Spirit is woven into the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is woven even into his baptism. Jesus' death and resurrection. Christianity is, is built on faith, not on works. There's a guarantee of salvation when we surrender completely to the Lord and completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we can't have our cake and eat it too. We either need to be all in or, or just not. There's, we can't be lukewarm. You know, all other religions are built on works, not faith. And there's no guarantee of salvation in those religions if you're religious you never know if you've set enough chants or if you've walked enough miles, if you've lit enough punks, a little incense, or even if you've rode your bicycle far enough. There's never a guarantee of salvation in those religions. But with Christ, there is. And his mission while he was here on earth is very clear, is to seek and save the lost and make disciples of all men everywhere. And when he commissioned those first disciples in the upper room, he commissioned them to go and make disciples. That's right. There are some that say that the, the gifts passed away at the, the first disciples. That's hogwash. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that Jesus commissioned the disciples to make more of themselves. And if you're making duplicates of yourselves, guess what that duplicate could do? The same thing that you could do. Amen? So if you're making duplicate disciples, then that means those disciples have been commissioned to do the same thing. Preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick. Are you with me so far? Those things have not passed away. They are still alive today. So Christ's mission is to seek and save the lost and make disciples of all men everywhere. You see, Jesus lived as a witness. In the life that he lived, he lived a sinless life. And the miracles he did, he did some awesome miracles. Walked on water. You know, we give Peter a hard time for falling into the water. I've got to give Peter a, a, a kudos to you, brother, because he actually got and stepped out of the boat onto the water and started walking on the water. Kudos to him, man. I've, never, I've tried it before. I just... Whoosh. Of course, to show you where my level of faith is. Here's my level of faith when it comes to that. Let me get all the electronics out of my pocket. Let me get my wallet out. I don't want to get wet. Well, what am I setting myself up there for? <laughs> I'm going for a swim. The mercy that Jesus showed. You know, a woman was caught in the midst of adultery. She was caught in the act. And the religious people, those nice guys, you know, drug her out there, threw her down before Jesus and said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. According to the law, she must be stoned. What say you? And Jesus didn't say a thing. He started writing in the sand. And from the oldest to the youngest, men started disappearing. I got a feeling he was probably writing down some secrets that these guys are harboring and showing them the fact that uh, you might have caught her in adultery, but this is what you've been doing, Jim Bob. And when everybody was gone, Jesus stood up. He said, woman, woman, where are your accusers? She said, they're not here. He said, then neither do I accuse you or condemn you. And then he told her something interesting. Go and sin no more. His mercy at that point. You see, this is the creator of the universe, the one that put the law in place. And he showed her mercy. We can learn a lot from that right there. Showing mercy to others. Showing mercy to people that are going to come in. And in the grace that he showed as well. You know, Peter denied Jesus three times the night of his trial. What did Jesus do when he was resurrected? He came back to Peter and restored him. He showed him grace and mercy. In John's gospel, the continuation of Jesus' mission is found within the commission of his followers. John 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now nearby, the disciples were watching from afar. They were, they were nearby, but they were afar. And they watched him in fear. 
And in our, in our text this morning, the disciples went up to the upper room and waited. They locked themselves in fear into this room. And then suddenly, with the locked room, with the locked doors, in comes Jesus. He just stood in their midst. Talk about a static shock. Talk about a, a, a punch out to, to fear, doubt, and unbelief. Here's Jesus. He just shows up. Well, didn't we lock those doors, John? I thought you locked those doors. I did lock the doors. Well, how did this guy get in here? And they realize who it is. It's the Messiah. John makes it clear in his gospel that Jesus had fulfilled all of what God had empowered him to do. Jesus had proclaimed the good news of the gospel. He had extended God's offerings of, of forgiveness and love. He, Jesus sacrificed himself to make an offering a living reality. But there still remained those disciples. And I'm going to tell you this right now, that the Lord is still working on this disciple. Yeah. Sheep know the shepherd's voice. What's neat is you could take three flocks of sheep down to a well, mix them all up. One could be shepherded by Arnold Schwarzenegger. One could be shepherded by Kermit the Frog, and the other one by a taxi cab driver from New York. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, he may call out when they're all mingled together, come with me if you want to live. You know, that, those things just start. And then Kermit the Frog's like, hey, let's go this way. Come on. And they, the sheep start following. And then that, that taxi cab driver's like, yo, let's go does a whistle, which I can't do. But those sheep will separate, and they will follow after the voice of their master. And that's the way with us as disciples. We are his sheep, and we know the voice of our master. Jesus shows up, and they know his voice. And then he breathes on them. Just like God breathed the breath of life in the first Adam, now that life was breathed into his disciples and the life is breathed into us. It didn't stop then. He continues to breathe on us. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for his breath. And it smells sweet. The Holy Spirit is the confirmation of Christ's power on earth. The Holy Spirit is who transforms. He transformed the upper room crowds into out front evangelists. His Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us from being timid and, and meek into people that can share the gospel without reservation and lay hands on the sick. John's gospel completes Jesus' mission by affirming that the presence of Jesus has never left this world. The incarnation is ongoing. Better than the Energizer Bunny. Keeps going and going and going. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings Christ to life in each and every one of us. The function of the Holy Spirit is to breathe the resurrection power, presence of power into each of our lives. And since the resurrection, since the resurrection, the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit has never left this world. Now there's coming a day where the Lord's going to re remove uh, the, the restrainer, which could be the, either the Holy Spirit or the church. Any way you look at it, he says, we're out of here. And, and that day's coming. But right now, his presence is still here and in a strong and mighty way. And Jesus' spirit-powered disciples have continued to gift creation with a living presence of the resurrected Jesus, the one sent by God to save the world and to bring us back into a garden relationship with the Father. And that's what Pentecost is about. It's about bringing people into the presence of the Father and pulling them out of hell and getting them to where that they can have a relationship with God himself and then duplicate that process so that we can multiply ourselves and see the world saved and glorified to Jesus Christ. I believe revival's coming to this world. And I want to make sure that our hearts are open to revival. How about you? I want to see this place on fire and stirred up for the Lord. Hallelujah. What's our duty then? Our duty is we are called to be in the line of fire and in the lineage of on-fire disciples. The church is supposed to be a blazing body. On fire, set apart, ablaze by the Holy Spirit. At our baptism, that, baptism the Holy Spirit planted an eternal hot spot in our souls. You're hot. We are now and forever among those who are responsible for keeping the fire going. We want to keep it stirred up and keep that fire going in our lives. The Holy Spirit in and through us fires up Christ's presence to be a living, life-changing, soul-stirring presence in this world. We need to be pliable and flexible. A great man who used to preach here used to say, Blessed are the flexible, they shall bend and not break. Thank you, Pastor Simon, for that one. It's a good one. Pentecost is when Christians celebrate their incendiary nature. We are, who, we are who we are because we are on fire with the Spirit. Our lives should be ablaze with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if we're not on fire, then guess what? We need to get fired up. Amen. Don't? Fired up. No. Let's try that again. You guys need to get fired up. Fired up. There you go. 
when, when fires start to die down, they get to a point where they're controllable. You can control a fire that's dying down. They don't produce much flame. If dying fires produce a lot of smoke than flames. And smoke blocks clear vision and clogs airways. We don't want to be a church that becomes a foggy, smoke-filled uh, arena. We need to stoke the fire. Invite the Holy Spirit to burn in you. Invite Him to speak through you. Invite Him to work on you. Stoke the fire. The celebration of Pentecost every year reminds us of our heritage. It rekindles us if we've become smoky and set it, set it, if we've become just kind of bleh in our faith. Pentecost is a divine puff of the Spirit infused with fresh air that inflames our discipleship and transforms our Christian fellowship into an on-fire, on-fire active uh, followership commended by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Holy Spirit is the one who gets us going, but we have to fan the flames. Pentecost isn't about just some huge fireworks display that's over in 15 minutes either. And we don't have to wait for Pentecost Sunday to celebrate Pentecost because we are Pentecostal. That means we can celebrate Pentecost every day. For all of Jesus' disciples throughout time, Pentecost is a heavenly light show directed to the places where we should live. A light that we behold in our hearts and souls. The light that we have been called to shine upon to our neighbors. And the light of Christ's continued presence in this world. Pentecost is a reminder that we have been given the power to live as witnesses. Pentecost is the reminder that the Lord did fulfill His promise to send the Holy Spirit. Our comforter, our guide, our healer, our counselor, and our friend. Pentecost empowers us to further the kingdom of God. And through us, the Holy Spirit keeps Jesus' ministry and mission and all of God's promises and possibilities alive and well in the world today as we live and as we allow Him to move through us. So what's our duty as believers? To let the Holy Spirit move and empower us to accomplish the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is accomplished through the mission of Jesus. Typical firewalls. You guys know what a firewall is, right? A firewall. Those of you that work with computers know that a firewall is designed to keep personal information personal. Designed to keep social security numbers safe, private information safe, your banking information, etc. Well, there are times that we build personal firewalls which are the bad sort in our lives that are designed to keep us from catching too fire for the Lord and too brightly. Dampens the flames of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And there's five different uh, controls or, or firewalls we're going to look at here just, just for a few minutes. Number one is the control firewalls. Our need to control is so severe that some of us are control junkies. If we were to see ourselves in the mirror in the spirit realm, we would look like a big remote control with buttons all over the place. This situation is going this way. I need to change it. This one's going this way. I don't like it. I need to change it. And we start walking around as a spiritual remote control. That's being a spiritual control junkie. We don't want to need that. We need to protect ourselves from, from, from being that way. Because if not, then we're, we're actually trying to protect ourselves from the unpredictability of fire. Control junkies quench the spirit. That's not how a defined, dignified Christian should act in church. You can tell I'm saved by the degree of the frown on my face. I got a feeling Jesus smiled a whole lot more than what those pictures show us on, uh, all over the place. I got a feeling that Jesus laughs. Why do I feel that way? Because he created us to laugh. I love it when little kids laugh. I lo- Magnum, he gets this belly laugh going. It cracks me up. When the, when the kids were little, or Dean would do the same thing, and Destiny, she'd do the same thing. They would get these belly laughs going, and it would just, it just cracks me up. I know the Lord's got a sense of humor. He made me. <laughs> I'll never forget being, when we were in Arkansas being transferred over into the youth pastor position there years and years ago. And the Lord hit me. The Holy Spirit hit me with laughter. I couldn't stop laughing. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't. I know that God's got a sense of humor. I got off on laughter somehow. Oh, control junkies. Quench the spirit. If we're truly on fire with the Holy Spirit, our lives are unpredictable, always open to change and periodic flare-ups. God bless you. So we don't want to be a control. We don't have, want to have control firewalls in place. The next one is a Laodicea firewall. That's a mouthful, a Laodicea firewall. How many Christians Laodicea everything? Instead of being hot or cold, we settle for tepid, a temperature that causes God to declare in Revelation 3.16... 
Because you are medium, mediocre, tepid, lukewarm, I will, listen to this, vomit you out of my mouth. Hmm, I wonder what rhymes with comet. Jesus said he'd vomit us out. Did you catch that? Jesus used the word vomit. I think that's funny. In other words, hot or hurl. <laughs> cold or hurl. You know, when I get, go get a big old glass of cold sweet tea, I want it to be cold. If I'm going for a hot glass of hot tea, I want it to be hot. Oh, I loved it. When I was in Africa years ago, there were, there were places where they had plantations and places you could stop and get tea. Fresh, hot tea. It was wonderful. And they put sugar in it. Lots of it. Ah. I loved it. But it was hot, and I liked it hot. I like my tea hot and I like it cold. I don't like it lukewarm. I think the only thing worse than lukewarm tea is lukewarm lemonade. That'll bless you. Disciples who live with a tepid faith are never on fire about anything. They merely smolder, <laughs> throw out the smolder, and throw off smoke that chokes and clears the throat of all those who come close to them. We don't want to be a Laodicean firewall. Or the safety first firewalls. Remember kids, safety first. How many of us live our lives with faith playing it safe? We make it the church, and we make the church in our faith an insulated fire retardant space. We wrongly identify the sanctuary of the church as a place where we are sheltered from risk. But that's not what the Holy Spirit breathed out by Jesus upon his upper room, hugging shattered disciples. The sanctuary of the church is not a place that is a safe haven free from risk. The sanctuary on fire for God is a place of life free to take risk. And instead of being safe-minded, we're called by the Spirit to be salvation-minded and to be mission-minded, to reach outside the four walls of this church. And then there's friendly fire firewalls. We forget that being a disciple, being out front for Jesus in this world means that we should expect to be prime targets for friendly fire. Family, family members that think you're just a religious nut. Friends that are Christian but don't want you to be too zealous for the Lord. Don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I have yet to meet that person. You know, honestly, Jesus was so heavenly minded that he, I mean, he's the son of God. And he was earthly good. Heavenly minded, so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good is an excuse not to be on fire for the Lord. <laughs> Evidence of the backlash of this world will be found on the backs of those who trust the Spirit, who keep the incarnation a resurrection reality. As the praise team comes, as Bruce and the praise team comes, I'm going to leave you with the fifth firewall. And we've hit this one a number of times in the past before. But it's important not to get caught up in the unforgiveness firewall. It's Mark 11, 22 through 26, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe all those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. And, you see, he didn't just stop there. We like to stop at the faith part. The faith part's cool. I get to speak something in a big, yeah, the faith part's awesome. But Jesus didn't stop there, did he? He continued on. And when you stand praying, not if, but when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. In all this, the first part is to have faith in God. Again, salvation is a requirement. We don't get to heaven by our works, by riding a bicycle by doing chance or anything else, we get to heaven through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. Second part, speak in faith. To speak in faith. When you pray, knowing that the Lord hears you. And the third part, believe you have already received and you shall have it. 
James 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it shall be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. The final most important part is to have unforgiveness in your heart is to live in sin on purpose. We've got to let it go. So how are we to receive and rekindle this fire? Again, the first part. So why do I need Jesus? Because we've all failed. God set his standard. He gave it to the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 20. His standard is the Ten Commandments. These are the commands I want you to do. All of us have broken God's law in one way or another. You may say, well, I haven't broken it. Have you ever told a lie? Do you know we didn't have to teach our kids to lie? <laughs> We're all born into sin. It comes pre-programmed. Some people have a propensity towards other sins. But the truth is, all of us need the Savior. All of us need to repent of sin and put our tr- faith and trust in Christ alone. And we ask by faith, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. And then we receive that. And it doesn't stop there. Because Christ said it's expedient. That's a big word for it. This has to happen. It's good that I go away so that I may send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And when he said another, that's another of the same kind. So you imagine this is going to be a simple example. That if I offered you an orange... And I said, would you like another? You would expect what? Another orange, right? Now, if we had fruit, and I said, here, I'm going to give you a piece of fruit. And I said, would you like another piece of fruit? It could be anything. But with this, Jesus is saying, I'm sending you another, the comforter, who is another of the same kind. It is his spirit who he sent. And wait for him, tarry for him in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. And it didn't stop there with those disciples. It didn't stop with 120, but it continued to perpetuate throughout the ages. And through every generation, there is an account of people being baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. He hasn't stopped. He continues to do so. And if there's any in this place today, and you want, yes, either I need Jesus as Savior, would you come, would you please stand with me, would you come to this altar? Or if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, He's willing and ready. You see, salvation is part of being a believer. Another part of being a believer is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So as the praise team comes, I'd like to pray for those that would like to receive salvation, those that would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or we're called to lay hands on the sick. If you need a healing in your body, would you please come? When the music fades, all the spirit and I sing. Longing just to bring something that that will bless you. I'll bring you more than a song, but a song in itself is not what you have found. You search much deeper.
like to close this morning's service in this way. I would like for those that are willing those that are willing to let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. It may be a heart change that needs to take place. Revival to come in. Would you join me at the front for, for a change that you may be sensing or, or even just that, Lord, if there's a change that needs to take place in me. Would you join me at the front? I want to close together with you this morning. I believe God's calling our church to reach out to the people that nobody wants. I believe He's calling us to love the people that nobody cares for. And if you can imagine the person that you don't like the most coming into this church, that's the people that God wants us to reach. The people that nobody else wants to reach out to. Listen, churches want the big tithers. They want the people that their lives are in line. But it's another thing to do what Jesus did and reach out to the Zacchaeuses in the world. It's another thing to reach out to the, to the woman that's been caught in the act of adultery. It's another to reach out to those people that you think, why? Would you join me this morning, Father? God, I ask that you would search our hearts right now. Lord, if there's anything in our lives that needs to change, would you please change us? Would you show us? And God, would you give us the grace to do so? And Father, I'm asking for a culture change within our church. Give us the grace to love the unlovable, the wisdom to reach the lost. Lord, the, the love to, to see the people that nobody wants to see them through your eyes, to see them as, as worth dying for, as worth ministering to. And Lord, I lift them right now to you, and I ask that you would send them our way, that you would send them across our paths. And Father, I ask that you would stir a fire up within our souls right now to reach out to those lost people, to see them as you see them, and to say, yes, I will, Lord. I will invite them to church. I will minister the gospel to them. I will give of myself to them. I'll give them the money that they ask for, Lord. I'll do what you called me to do. I want to be sensitive to your spirit on how to reach these people. God, I've seen the lost, and I'm like, who are these people? And you showed me they're the people that nobody wants. God, I pray that you give us the heart for those people and you'd give us the wisdom to reach them and that we would do so and live in your will. May we not be a Laodicean church. God, I want us to be a hot and on fire for you, a hot water that, that medicates. I want us to be cold for you, cold water that refreshes. Lord, may streams of living water flow from our souls to those you've called us to. God, would you forgive us of the times we've looked at people and said, you're not worth my time. Yes, Lord. Would you forgive us of being selfish? 
God, help us to have the heart and mind that it's not the facilities that make the church. It's the people. Help us not to get into the rut either of thinking that just the people that are here right now make up this church. But God, you have called us to those that nobody likes. You've called us to walk in your power. And Lord, I uplift any in this place that need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to you right now. And I ask that you would baptize them in Jesus' name and in the Holy Spirit right now with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And Lord, again, I pray over all those that need a touch from you. I thank you for anointing them with your precious Holy Spirit and your power and healing them. God, change us for your glory. I pray that we'd have hearts to hear and not only to hear, but also the willingness to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. I love you. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight for meetings.